So let's first of all talk about the IPS. First of all, an IPS does what? It's a very, it's a very general document. It's not very detailed. It's a very general document, okay? Over, not very detailed, that is supposed to set the parameters or the understanding between the portfolio manager and the client as to how that account should be managed. Okay, it's sort of a blueprint. It's a blueprint that both of them, both the portfolio manager and the client can turn back to if anything goes awry to look at how an investment was in line or was not in line with the investor's objectives and or constraints. So it's, a, and now the IPS needs to not only provide two objectives and five constraints, you must understand that an IPS must be developed for each client. Why? Because each client is different or unique. You cannot have sort of a cookie cutter IPS for all individual clients. Or you can't say, here's my IPS for all individuals over the age of 45. Or here's my IPS for all married couples. Or here's my, my, um, uh, my IPS for all widows. Okay? There is no such thing. Every IPS is going to be distinct for that particular client because every client is distinct. No two clients are going to be exactly the same. So therefore you need to develop an IPS for each individual client and even for each institution because not every life insurance company is the same. Not every pension plan is the same. Some pension plans might have uh, the average um, participants, uh, participants might be 43 years old. Another one might be 32 years old. So that might affect the amount of risk that they can take. So no two clients are exactly alike. All right. That being said, also the IPS serves as an agreement, as I said, between the portfolio manager and the client on how the account will be managed. Now, why is this important for it to be, in ge to be general, not too detailed? Why? Because if for any reason the portfolio manager passes away or the portfolio manager leaves, quits, starts his own, whatever the reason is, he's no longer there, that IPS can be transferred to another portfolio manager and that portfolio manager can immediately continue the process of the investing or managing the account without having to put anything on hold. Okay, that's very important. The IPS also must be reviewed at a minimum, how often? Annually. Every IPS should be reviewed at least once annually, if not more often than once a year, if there's a life-defining event. That's the key word there, a life-defining event. For example, the last time you have reviewed that account with your client might have been six months ago, but guess what? Now they just had a baby or twins. Having a, a, a birth in the family, a child, okay? The death of a spouse, okay? Uh, the desire to save for the children's college, going to college, saving for their college education, saving for retirement, retirement. These are all what we call life-defining events. So anytime there's a life-defining event, we need to be able to re-review the uh, the IPS. So if there's a child born or a spouse passes away or we just entered into retirement or the children just started school, these are all going to have a major impact on us. We call these life-defining events. What are What is not a life-defining event? An example of an event that is not a life-defining event is I got to put a new roof on the house in six months. That's not a life-defining event. My wife and I want to go on a vacation to Europe in nine months because we haven't been on vacation in seven years. That's not a life-defining event. Life-defining event is actually going to impact your overall you know, financial wealth and situation. That's the key idea there. So the examples that I gave you are the primary life-defining events. Okay. All right, so that being the case, every time there's a life-defining event, you would need to re-review it, but you must review the, uh, for the uh, IPS at least annually. Now, don't get this confused. There's another requirement that we learned about in the ethics material, which, which is that at least you, that the firm should be getting what? Quarterly statements, right? They should be reviewing uh, their employees' uh, accounts on a quarterly basis, right? If not more, at least hopefully on a monthly basis. But the IPS needs to be re reviewed on an annual basis if not more often, if there's a life-defining event. Okay. All right. Now, why don't we do this? Why don't we talk about each of the components of the objectives and the constraints? And then once I've sort of articulated that, there's one other thing that I want to go over, which is strategic asset allocation versus tactical asset allocation. And then we're pretty much done with this reading. Again, my job here is to make sure that you understand the material in the context of which 
the exam is going to test it. It's not to go over every single page in the CFA books. That you have an ability to do. It's called reading, okay? And you are all capable of reading. And I'm not trying to be facetious or sarcastic or cynical. I'm just saying you don't need me to read the books to you. You need me to sort of guide you in terms of now I've read the material, what do I need to focus on and how does this show up on the exam? When we talk about the objectives, let's talk about the return requirements and the risk tolerance. Okay, and as I said before, they need to be in sync. Okay, before we go over the return requirements and the risk tolerance, what you should also keep in mind is that, as I said before, the IPS is going to be very general, not very detailed. There should be no discussion of specific asset classes and there should be no discussion of capital market expectations. In other words, whatever the portfolio manager's expectations are for returns, uh, for expected returns, variances, covariances among the asset classes or uh, within the asset classes or any kind of how the funds should be allocated is not discussed in the IPS. First, we develop the IPS, that's step number one. Then we add to the IPS once it's created. Once the IPS is created based on the objectives and the constraints of the clients, then we include the capital market expectations of the portfolio manager in terms of what he expects the environment to be. Does he expect interest rates to go up or down, inflation to go up or down? How is that going to impact the expected returns on specific asset classes or between asset classes and the variance and the COVID standard deviation and the correlation? And then once we take the IPS, plus the portfolio manager capital market expectations, IPS plus capital market expectations equals asset allocation. Then we work with the client to determine how to allocate the funds that there are to the investable universe of assets that the client is willing to invest in. Domestic stocks, domestic bonds, international stocks, international bonds, real estate, money market funds, venture capital, private play, whatever it may be. So again, remember that IPS creation, then capital market expectations equals asset allocation. That's key.